And we are here with the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Prime Minister Nagib bin Tok Abdul Razak. Um, it is a great honor and a great pleasure to have you, Prime Minister. Thank you. I want to start with something you wrote. You wrote an article for the New York Times in which you said the central challenge, or one of the central challenges facing the Islamic world is the problem of Muslim youth. Explain what you meant. What is that challenge? It is evident that the, um, the pressure for change came about from the youth. In the Arab Spring? In the Arab Spring. And if in, in any country for that matter, not only a Muslim country, if unemployment amongst the youth runs at 25% or even more, and coupled with a rather um, autocratic system, which is not responsive to the needs of the people, then you have a very lethal combination, which eventually resulted in, in a massive a demand for change, even a violent demand for change. And that's exactly the challenge, I think, facing most countries, particularly the Muslim world, that we have to take care of the young people. We have to give them jobs. We, most importantly, we have to give them hope for the future. Is that about education? Is it mostly about jobs? It is, I think, the whole raft of things that you have to do. Basically, you start with education. But beyond that, you have to have a, a system that will actually deliver. You've got to deliver them jobs. You have to give, deliver them a promise of a better future. And if these people are marginalized for whatever reason, uh, then uh, you, know, you get situations in which uh, they will be very restless. You, you talk about, you know, in a sense, kind of getting the society moving, getting the dynamics so that you have these jobs and opportunities. What about the, the point that other people make? That, no, 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 you need to reform it within Islam, that you need to uh, de-radicalize elements of, of, of Islam. What do you say to them? I think, I think uh, in, in a sense, uh, you know, we, we in Malaysia, if I can use Malaysia as an example, we would take the initiative for change because I'm a great advocate of a planned change, systematic plan transformation because that will give you the outcome that is more desirable than a violent change. And until today, those countries embroiled in the Arab Spring have not really fully recovered. They've not got the dividends of that. And it will be some time before they can really, you know, kind of stabilize the situation. Maybe it's stabilized today, but in terms of, you know, getting the kind of growth, getting more jobs, getting a better future, I think there's quite some way uh, before that will, will happen. And with respect to Islam itself, I think the, the whole interpretation of Islam you know, has to be predicated on the fact that Islam is fundamentally a moderate and progressive religion. And that's exactly how you know, we've tried to do it in Malaysia. But you have had critics. You have had um, fundamentalists in Malaysia who wanted much more you know, extreme, puritanical, call it what you will, version of Islam. Do, do, how, do you, how do you diffuse that kind of criticism? Uh, you know, by engaging them, uh, you know, by, by uh, communicating to the people uh, that, uh, you know, Islam is essentially a moderate and progressive religion. Uh, the fact that we don't have, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the hudud laws in Malaysia, uh, you know, you know doesn't, doesn't mean that you're not an Islamic country. I mean, uh, Egypt doesn't have uh, uh, hudud laws. I explain what those are. Those are, those are the full Sharia uh, laws, you know, you know, amputation for, um, for, for stealing, for example, and stoning for adultery, things like that. Uh, because the, the fundamental objective for Sharia law is actually to achieve justice. Uh, and that, that's important, not to lose sight of the fact that that is fundamental to the objective of Sharia, is to achieve justice. And that Islam is essentially about advice. It's not about punishment. It's about prevention. It's about advice. It's about educating people. The tarbiyah, as they say in Arabic, it is educating the people. Where do, how do you rate the dangers of 
uh, Islamic radicalism, jihadi groups, m militant Islam, terrorism, you know, that whole spectrum uh, in Southeast Asia today. After 9-11, as you remember, there were many fears, uh, and there was the Bali bombing right after. It was the first major terrorist attack after. And so people thought, well, maybe Southeast Asia is going to be the, new, the next place where all this bubbles up. Where do we stand in 2013? I think, I think most of it is behind us, actually. I think we've dealt with the radical Islam, an extreme version of Islam, uh, in a positive way. Of course, um, you know, uh, some form of uh, you know, military type actions were unavoidable. Uh, but, you know, by, by, by um, communicating what Islam is all about, and also, you, you, you must have read that we were involved in solving the southern Philippines, Bansamoro thing problem that went on for 40 years and, and cost the lives of 120,000 people. That meant, uh, you know, the whole potential of that area being radicalized, being linked up with uh, 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 Al-Qaeda directly or through the various groups. And that has been eliminated. So that's a huge contribution to, towards, uh, you know, peace and, and, and a more uh, uh, moderate form of Islam in, in Southeast Asia. So your intelligence services uh, sense that the kind of things that they're worried about in 2002, 2003, it's, it's, it's waned, it has declined. It has receded uh, quite substantially. But the threat really more you know, comes from, from Indonesia, uh, you know, because uh, you know, some of the madrasas uh, that they have there uh, has been a source of some of the radical preachings of Islam. And from Indonesia, they went to Malaysia. Uh, Abu Bakr Bashir, for example, uh, preached in Malaysia, and he radicalized a few Malaysians. But uh, Indonesians have been more effective now dealing with it. So I think the whole threat of militant Islam, I think it has receded quite substantially in Southeast Asia. You have set yourself a goal a somewhat ambitious goal of uh, getting Malaysia out of the middle income trap. Uh, this is a range of per capita GDP, uh, you know, somewhere between six, six and twelve thousand, thirteen thousand dollars, where countries do get stuck. There are very few that have made the transition out of it. Uh, if you look back over the last twenty or thirty years, you see Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, but that's sort of it. Um, what are you going to do? How, what, what is, the, is there a, a silver bullet that gets you, gets you out of the trap? It's exactly what you know, we realized. When I came to office uh, 2009, I realized that we have recovered. Once we recovered from the Asian financial crisis of 1997, but growth was slowing down. It was not at the breakneck speed, 8 9% we used to have. It was slowing down in region of 3 to 4%. And then it was then that we realized that we were in the so-called middle income trap. So we needed a breakout strategy. And the breakout strategy was the new economic model. The new economic model was predicated on two important uh, programs. One is the economic transformation program. The other one is the strategic reform initiative, SRIs. So if I can use an analogy, the uh, ETP uh, would be akin to a vehicle, a car, that's traveling fast. But the, the, the SRI, the reform initiatives, would be like the highway. You do need a quality highway in order for you to drive quite fast and get there safely. So with the combination of both, we have managed to turn the situation around. Uh, we know we have achieved 5% growth rate, five, uh, last, third quarter last year was 5.2 percent. Since, uh, um, since 2009, when I came in, the income per head, uh, GDP was 6,700 US dollars. Uh, last year, it was 9,750. That's a 45 percent jump in income per capita within four years. So. Um, the results speak for themselves. Real change and real progress is taking place in Malaysia. Now, you have one big advantage that a lot of middle-income countries don't, which is you have oil and natural gas, and oil prices are, 
a high um, in historical terms. Uh, does that has that been a cushion that has allowed you to to get through this? Yes, but you have to use uh, your oil wealth in in a very prudent way, because there's, there's of course the the oil trap as well, as you know. Uh, I think basically we've done quite well with oil resources, uh, but we should not uh, use too much of that uh, for subsidy, for example, because that's uh, short-term consumption. You need to use the oil wealth to increase your productive capacity, your productive to invest in productive investment that will generate uh, higher incomes in the future. Is the is the sh should you go even further? and adopt the model that a country like Norway does, which is that all the oil revenue goes into a trust and is not used for current governmental expenditures? A small portion of that has gone into that trust. I think we can do a lot, a lot more. may not be quite like uh, the Norwegian model, uh, but as for as long as that kind of income is used in terms of productive investment, even short-term productive investment, which will yield dividends over a longer period. You have had um, relations with Singapore, I mean Malaysia, that have been uh, sometimes uh, cordial and sometimes not so cordial. Uh, where would you say things stand now? Uh, I think there's, there's, there's um, a realization, I think, between Sian Log and myself uh, that we should put the past behind us, that our future of Malaysia and, and Singapore are inextricably linked. And if we can work together in a more cooperative way, then both Malaysia and Singapore would benefit. Certainly Iskandar, for example, you talk about Iskandar, the development uh, opposite Singapore, is hugely dependent on, on, on Singapore. On but, uh, and Singapore is also dependent on, on Malaysia because uh, they need the space. Uh, and because and uh, the cost is going up in Singapore. So, so I told Sian Lung recently that, I don't mind, you can be the Manhattan, or we'll be New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> um, Prime Minister, you lost uh, the two-third majority you had in, in, in Parliament. UMNO um, has been a dominant party. Uh, why did you lose, and what does it tell you about what are inevitably going to be the upcoming elections in Malaysia? We're dealing with uh, a, a more, you know, difficult uh, uh, voters today. I think uh, a few things have happened. Uh, it's structural in nature. It is not cyclical as such. Um, you know, I see the advent of uh, ICT, social media, uh, as both uh, something good, but also our bane could be our Achilles heel as well. Uh, and I'll see the, you know, the level of expectation uh, increasing and people are much more educated and therefore more critical. Uh, having realized that, uh, therefore, uh, as the government, uh, we need to do things differently. Uh, we need to realize that you know, people are not going to give their vote to you based on how much you've done in the past. I mean, nobody can deny the fact that, you know, AMNO and Barisan National, we are, we are the people who fought for independence. We are the people who developed the country. But, you know, the people today are saying, okay, that's in the past. Uh, what we want to know, what can you do for us now and in the future? And that's important for us to realize that, uh, you know, the levels of, of uh, expectations have increased by leaps and bounds. So therefore, you know, the kind of performance that we have to deliver as, as a government has indeed, uh, you know, as the bar has been raised very considerably. Uh, but we are, you know, we're committed, we're working as hard as possible. And I think uh, I'm encouraged by the support that we have received by the people. And hopefully we'll get a good uh, mandate this time around. Do you think Anwar Ibrahim is your most uh, formidable foe? Well, certainly he's head of the opposition, uh, and uh, we'd like to, uh, you know, to uh, present our agenda to the people. And I believe that people will see that our agenda for the country is more credible. 
What about the preferences that are given in Malaysia for the Malays, a uh, policy that is controversial, particularly with the Chinese uh, business community, mm. which feels that it, uh, it is, it is uh, not moving in the direction a modern country should, mm, mm, which is meritocratic mm, mm, uh, and based on achievement and reward. Mm, mm. Uh, you still have many, many preferences. Mm. Is there, a, um, will you rethink that mm. and will you implement a rethink, a, a, a change? In fact, a process has started. For example, uh, entry to university now is based on, on merit. Uh, and and, and uh, that in, has increased a percentage of uh, Chinese Malaysians into university. But uh, uh, interestingly, the Malaysian Indians have fared badly. So they won a quota system. Because the previous system, you know, they got about 7%. But now it's down to about 3%. But that goes to show that it is based on merit. And uh, helping people who deserve to be helped, for example, those uh, with whose income level is, you know, 3,000 ringgit or $1,000 per month. And that's across the board, irrespective of ethnic background. So everybody gets it. So we are moving towards a policy on the basis of needs as opposed to the basis of race. But there still is a feeling there's some, there's some. that with government yeah, contracts, yeah. with all those things, there's still but a lot. But even government contract, I think quite, quite a bit of it is based on open bidding. Uh, some of it, of course, uh, uh, there's some preference for Bumiputra. But the, by and large, the uh, non-Malays in Malaysia, non-Bumiputra in Malaysia, don't actually oppose affirmative action. But what they want is to be seen the way you implement that policy should be done in a more transparent and fairer way. And what, what they deserve as Malaysians, the non Muslims, then they should also get what they deserve. As you look at uh, East Asia, um, do, you, do you worry about the rise of China? Many East Asian countries over the last two years, Philippines, Vietnam, certainly Japan, of course, uh, have been quite worried about what they see as um, Chinese moves, uh, territorial, uh, otherwise, that are something of a departure and suggest a new assertive China. I think the rise of China is uh, inevitable. I think we have to come to terms with that. Uh, and if you accept the fact that you know, China will be the economic power and the size of the economy, not per capita, but certainly the size economy, will exceed that of the United States by maybe 2030 or even sooner, then you realize that there are opportunities that you can leverage on, on, on the size of that economy. And that's taking a very positive attitude towards China. And uh, China has become our number one trading partner. Total trade between Malaysia and China, taking into account trade from third countries. It's approaching a hundred billion dollars a year, and that's huge. So China is a big market for us. Uh, you know, China is also becoming a bigger investor to Malaysia. You know, the first, interestingly, the first um, Chinese university that has been allowed by the government to have a foreign branch campus is Malaysia, uh, and, and that that university will will be a reality in a couple of years' time. So we have this very, very positive and mutually beneficial relationship with China. But a, a, a China that's big is also a China that's going to be more assertive. It goes with it. And, and therefore, we, we need to manage that. And, and I believe that uh, uh, you know, we can negotiate, we can enter into uh, dialogue with China and uh, trying to find uh, peaceful, amicable uh, solutions, particularly to the South China Sea issue. You had a diplomatic foray recently. You, you went to Gaza and you visited the leadership of Hamas. Is it not fair to say that Hamas remains a principal uh, stumbling block on the road to peace? Because in order to have a two-state solution, the Israelis would argue, you need the Palestinians to accept the right of Israel to exist, and Hamas mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. not accept mm -hmm. the right of Israel to mm -hmm. exist. I think we should go step by step. 
I think one, the first thing is to have unity government uh, in, in representing the entire Palestinian people. Without a unity government, uh, I don't think uh, any kind of a peaceful solution would be possible. Did you tell that to Hamas? I did, in no uncertain terms. Uh, privately, as well as my speeches, first of all, I said I came here for humanitarian reasons. I did not come here to side with Hamas. I did not come here to interfere with the internal politics. I came here with a mission, mission of peace, mission of, for humanitarian reason, and basically to tell them, look, you know, you have to be united, form a unity government. And once you have a unity government, then you, you should negotiate with Israelis. I'm, I'm a believer that a two-state solution is the only viable solution. But mind you, uh, the Israelis must also play ball, so to speak. I um, mean, increasing settlements uh, in, on Palestinian soil is not helpful at all. Uh, and and, and, and um, some of the sharp uh, rhetorics as a run-up to the uh, elections in, in Israel are of great concern to us. Do you believe that um, when you look at, at uh, the, the future of Southeast Asia, it will be able to maintain its, uh, uh, it, it, its uh, kind of uh, association, its, its uh, multilateral um, groupings? Will they deepen, uh, or is it going to be swamped into a larger Asia, particularly with the rise of China? I think the centrality of ASEAN is something that uh, uh, we will be uh, we will try to maintain, and there is recognition of that. You know, in, in the meetings, so ASEAN plus one, ASEAN plus three, even at East Asia Summit, it has been emphasized over and over again that the key to the regional architecture, the only viable approach would be the centrality of ASEAN. What do you think of President Obama's so-called pivot to Asia? I think it's good. I think the fact that you know, we're able to get the U.S. president two years running, you know, to attend our summit, and he's committed to attend the next round as well. And it speaks volumes of the importance of ASEAN and, and our part of the world. And, and President Obama knows that for the for United States to, to maintain itself as a Pacific power, it has to be, you know, based on on a viable kind of a partnership with ASEAN as well, plus East Asia. So the fact that he is committed uh, you know, towards ASEAN and East Asia Summit, I think will be good for us. If you do get reelected in this next election, uh, what, what is your major focus going to be in the next term? We have a job to complete, right? And I know we've, we've uh, said it publicly, unashamedly, that of course, we want to be a fully developed nation by the year 2020. And I'm committed to do everything and anything possible to make it happen. And if I get my second term, that's exactly what I will do. Mr. Prime Minister, pleasure to have you. Thank, Thank you. you. Wonderful.